Uh, it's a treat to be back. I haven't been back. That's one of those things of, in life of, of not being able to come back. So my things have changed since 1979 uh, in Starkville, Mississippi. Um, I don't know how good of a storyteller I will be. Buddy Lee is fantastic, and you don't want to miss Bobby Green or Matt and Tim Nichols. They are wonderful to do. But it's always fun to talk about plants, especially talk about this particular topic, which has gotten so much attention recently uh, over the last several years and why it's so important to us. I do have to brag on my garden in Huntsville. I'm, I am from Huntsville, Alabama, and this is the Huntsville Botanical Garden. This is our children's garden and nature center uh, that we have. And then this is often when people always ask me, uh, what's your garden look like at home? I show them this picture. <laughs> because my garden at home does not look like this. I was definitely one of those, the cobbler who has no shoes, because once I got home, if I ever did get home, that was not what I wanted to do. But this, we have 112 acres uh, in Huntsville. We're a little over 300,000 visitors a year. Uh, and it's amazing, this is our 30th year we've been open to the public. And to think back in 1988, what we opened with to where we are today is truly amazing. Um, Many of the things that we see, this is our brand new visitor center. I've got to say, when I drive in the front gates now, I tear up. I never thought we would have something like this at our garden. Uh, so I would hope you'll make the drive over uh, to see what we've got over in Huntsville. From our collection standpoint, we actually have the largest collection of trillium that you'll find in the United States. And then our collection of native azaleas, especially the all the species plus many different crosses and the hybrids that are coming out uh, is one of our better collections that you'll see as well as all the other plants that are so uh, key to southern gardens. Um, we also we've got the largest open-air butterfly house, seasonal butterfly house in the country and then every year every summer we do a specific um, event or festival mainly geared toward children. We realized that that was kind of a niche we've had. We've done Legos in the past, we've done tree houses, uh, water events, um, and then this summer, we've done dinosaurs twice. Dinosaurs is a money maker, I will tell you that right now. So we went on this one, it's called Gardens of Myth, and usually that runs through the summer. Uh, it's 200 miles from here to there. There is no straight road between here and there, but it was a pleasant drive to come over this morning. So if you ever get that way, please come see us. Uh, we are a private public garden. We're not part of the city, so we're a private nonprofit. Um, and so we're supported by uh, the membership that we have, the festivals that we do, and, and things that go out. For the same thing is I would tell you, visit the garden that you have here. Today was my first day to go out and visit, uh, and it's really amazing to see the things that are there and what the programs that they're offering and give the support uh, to Jeff and to um, Candace there. Now, I love the story of the birds and the bees. Uh, one time I wrote a weekly garden column uh, in Huntsville when we had a newspaper. Do you all still have a newspaper? Yeah, we really don't. I mean, they're gone. But uh, I wrote a weekly garden column, and I'd get questions. All of them were questions that were sent in to me from people around and asking. And so one of them was, why wasn't my holly? I didn't have any berries on it. So I did the talk of, the sex life of a holly, which of course was just to get attention because nobody wanted to know about dioecious plants. But the sex life of a holly got a little more attention and we had to talk about pollination and we have male and female plants and you gotta have a stud somewhere that can provide the pollen so you get the berries. So in a way, that kind of ties into what's going on here and what we're doing with pollinator health. Just so happens that last week was National Pollinator Week. Um, I didn't realize this when we set the talk up, and unfortunately, this doesn't get enough attention that it should. We're trying to raise the awareness of this and pollinators and how important they are to us, but it officially was National Pollinator Week last week, and we've seen lots of activities that are around of protecting our pollinators um, throughout the country. 
Of course, lots of different hashtags. It's bigger than the bees. Of course, this much started with talking about honeybees because that was the pollinator that had the most attention uh, brought to it, but we know the story is much bigger than that. Uh, pollinators are essential to us because it is what transfers the genetic traits in the plant to produce the seed that produce either fruit for us to eat or the next generation of plants that are out there. There are over a thousand vertebrates that are pollinators, birds, bats, small mammals. How many of you drink tequila? Don't have to raise your hand. Bats pollinate agave. So we got to have bats as a pollinator for tequila. But over 200,000 species of insects are pollinators. All the attention gets focused on honeybees, but there are numerous other insects that are pollinators. It produces over 200 or $20 billion worth of products annually, and we're beginning to see things like 25% bumblebee species are thought to be in serious decline. The first bumblebee species went on the Endangered Species Act out on the, in the West. This past year, that's our first native uh, bee that has gone on uh, in listed as endangered. And then we've all noticed that the monarch butterflies have been in decline. And butterflies, again, are very big uh, pollinators. Now, how I got involved first in pollinators was in our butterfly house. Uh, we built a butterfly house, quite frankly, to bring these guys into the garden. It was our way as an outreach to reach school children. Uh, it wasn't enough that we could just say, come bring the kids out to the garden for a field trip. Once now, we did that for probably our first three or four years, but the curriculums changed, everything went to testing, and so we had to make sure we had a field trip that met the science standards for a grade level and how it was going to improve test scores. Fortunate part, in the second grade, all the students learn about the life cycle of the butterfly. So we set up, a, built the butterfly house, and had field trips looking at the life cycle of the butterfly. And of course, what's critical to that are the plants, because of the plant and insect interaction, whether it's the host plants where they lay their eggs or the nectar plants that provide nourishment. But it was to get these children in. We do over 12,000 children a year through the garden, and we have people from all over the southeast that will come and visit uh, with field trips just to the garden to see it. Um, we talked more about butterflies and hummingbirds at that time than we did bees. One of the interesting parts in all of this, it's difficult to talk about bees with kids and parents because there are so many parents now that are petrified of bees and bee stings. We've even had parents call us up and say, we want to visit a part of the garden where there are no bugs. <laughs> it's a little tough to where we can say there that, that we don't have any. But what we do with the field trips, of course, is they do scavenger hunts looking for the different insects that are there and the different parts that they'll find, loving to find these critters like these caterpillars. Uh, once they find a critter, they get real excited. It's hard to get them excited about an azalea or a camellia even, um, or flowers, but it's, they'll get excited about critters. But then they begin to understand the relationships that are there. When these eggs hatch and that caterpillar comes out, it essentially devours that plant. That's the host plant for that particular butterfly. Uh, this Again, this is fennel with a swallowtail that's there, and he's just going to eat that fennel up. And what's so critical about that is, how many of you are familiar with this book? Any of you seen that? Yeah, Last Child in the Woods. This was written over 10 years ago. And I think the gentleman, Dr. Louvre, was kind of tongue-in-cheek when he said it. He created this thing, he called it nature deficit disorder, because everything had to be a disorder. Well, unfortunately, 10 years later, he was very prescient because our kids don't go outside anymore. They do not go out and play. And this, to me, has been one way that we've been able to get kids away from screens green screen or screens and get them outside and looking at nature. Um, I think it's critical that we do that because if they grow up without an appreciation for it, when they get to be our age, it doesn't matter to them. And if we want to preserve what we have around us, 
uh, it's very critical. So I use that as a way to reach that group. Um, as I say, we talk more about butterflies and hummingbirds. We know the bees have really become the critical issue here, and it's mainly because of food security. One out of every three bites of food we take is insect pollinated. Now, corn is not, wheat is not, they're wind pollinated. But when we start talking about almost all of our fruit crops, uh, soybeans, all of our beans, things like that, they are insect pollinated. The number one insect pollinator is the honeybee. Interesting part there is a honeybee is not native to the United States. It's actually a, was brought over with the early colonists, I think because they wanted honey to make mead and drink, do a little drinking as we uh, talked about, but they wanted the sugar, the sweetener for sure. But it is essentially naturalized here, but the honeybee is the number one um, pollinator that we see out there. It's really got become a very emotional debate when we start talking about bee declines because everybody then starts looking at what's killing the bees, what's the problem that we're seeing there, and many of the things have pointed back to agriculture and especially to pesticides. What we found is that it's not as simple as one silver bullet, solve this, the bees will be just fine. It's a multitude of things that are there whether it's nutrition, queen failure, genetics, beekeeping practices, weather patterns. But we've pretty well centered on the big three. And first and foremost, and every beekeeper I've ever known, any beekeepers in the audience? will say that this mite, the Varroa mite, is their number one problem. The Varroa mite is all, will wind up being in almost every managed hive that you'll find. And it's a little hitchhiker that gets on the back of the bee and it opens it up to all types of other parasites, viruses, and other things, and we have bee decline. One of the things that you read a lot about is the chemicals found in honey when they go out and test it, and they say, oh, we found all these pesticides in your honey. The number one pesticide you will find in your honey is a miticide that was put on by the beekeeper to kill the varroa mite. It's not other things that were sprayed out. It was because they've got to control this guy. Uh, the second thing we see in bee health is habitat loss. Now, I can't ever imagine that Starkville, Mississippi or Huntsville, Alabama will look like that top right picture. I guess that's California. You can always blame anything of California. But there's no question that we are taking out land and putting constructed pieces on it impermeable surfaces, a lot more concrete, and every time we take out those green spaces, we lose nectar-producing plants that they're foraging on. Now, one thing I thought that was interesting, the bottom left picture looks like farmland. And at first thought, you would think, oh, that's green, things are growing on it, that shouldn't be a problem to our foraging insects. Well, this is cornland in the Midwest. When ethanol subsidies were raised so much, so much land that was in the conservation reserve program that we were paying you not to farm, it became to your benefit to now farm it to grow corn because you were being paid so much with ethanol subsidies. So they took it out of this fallow or just left natural area and turned it into acres upon acres of growing corn. Well. Corn, while that's fine for things like holding water or erosion control, it produces nothing of benefit to bees because it's a wind-pollinated plant, so it doesn't have to produce nectar that attracts insects to it. So now, all of a sudden, all these acres that they used to just fly over and find, dandelions and clover and whatever was there as nourishment is gone. And so this is one that has been very interesting to look at. In the UK today, their most recent study says they think habitat loss is the number one factor, if they're ranking them, of what's to contributing to bee decline. The best part of that, and just in saying this, is this is something that each of us can do something about. 
That's what I find encouraging about this whole thing. Usually when we talk about big problems, each of us individually look at it and go, well, I really can't do anything that's going to make a difference. Habitat loss is one that each and every one of us can do something that will make a difference. And then the last one we'll talk about is pesticides. There's no question that pesticides play a role and have played a role in bee deaths. Pesticides, especially insecticides, were made to kill insects. Bees are insects. So if they're used incorrectly and done at the wrong dosages, sprayed on the wrong plants and put at the wrong time, we may have adverse effects. I will be the first to tell anyone, don't use them if you don't have to. We've got lots of methods of control and we usually go through a hierarchy, we call it integrated pest management to figure out how we're gonna solve a problem. We don't reach for the nuclear bomb when we see our first aphid. So we've got a way that we can handle a situation, but if we get to a point where we have to use an insecticide on a plant to solve a problem, then you make sure, make damn sure, you follow that label you do everything it says. There are now B warnings on every label that's out there and that you'd use it correctly so that we do not have problems and issues that come about. The simple answer that's come about in much of it is just ban all pesticides. That's easy to say, but because of issues that are out there where we have to have pesticides to control certain insects or problems, just banning them won't solve that part of the problem. But we must be careful when we're talking about with bees. Uh, lots of programs have come out of this. This is one I've been very engaged with, the Grow Wise Be Smart, promoting healthy habitats. Uh, American Hort is a, a group I'm engaged, and then also the offshoot of that is the Horticulture Research Institute. That's our 501c3 group that funds research in the green industry looking at problems that we have facing us. Pollinator health was definitely one of those. And the main reason we looked at it as was because there was a big movement to ban certain pesticides. Now, it's very uncomfortable at times to stand up in front of groups and say, we shouldn't ban these particular products because I sure don't want to be a shill for the pesticide industry. It's kind of like being for big oil or so. But there are times when it is necessary to have them. How many of you are from the Midwest and seen emerald ash borer damage or the ash trees that are gone? Well, one of the few pesticides we have to control the ash borer is what we call a neonicotinoid um, insecticide. If we don't have something like that, then every tree around, and it pretty much has happened, of ash are gone. Right now we have a problem in the eastern seaboard of hemlock. All the native hemlock are under stress from the hemlock woolly adelgia. We don't have a product to combat that except a neonicotinoid insecticide. So if they're banned, then we don't have anything that will stop the progress, you know, the procession of that killing all the native trees. So we have to make sure that we're using them correctly. What happened here is in Europe they did ban it. It became a very strong movement and I think was brought out by the groups that were very much against GMO foods. When they tried to ban the GMO food products they were unsuccessful. But then they found that one of the products, especially in um, Oh, what a, rape, what are we, what's the other word for rape? The yellow, we shouldn't call it rape. I, I can't think of it. Canola, yeah, canola. Was, the seed was treated with a neonicotinoid insecticide so that you didn't have to spray later. Actually, for the farmer, it's a great thing. Well, what they were finding is that the dust, when we planted those seeds, went around to the surrounding areas and caterpillars and bees that fed on those plants all of a sudden were dying. So they said, aha, this is what's killing everything. Let's ban the neonic. What we've said is that there's not enough research that has shown exactly how that 
insecticide is translocated to the plant. They're systemic insecticides that are taken up by the root, they go through the plant and then out to the foliage, and so when an insect feeds on the foliage, he gets the insecticide. Well, bees are going to the pollen and nectar of a plant, and no one ever had done a study to say how much of that insecticide do we get in the pollen and nectar of a plant, as opposed to just saying, in the lab, if I poured the insecticide on top of the bee, it killed it. Well, in nature, does one ever take that dosage and dump it right on top of there? So we did a series of studies. This is one uh, we did up at Michigan State University where they took these Coleman tents. Half of the plants were treated with the insecticide. The other half were not treated. They took the top 10 annual plants sold in garden centers, marigolds, impatiens, petunias, um, geraniums, and they put them in there and then released bees. Went back a month, six weeks later, all the bees were dead in all the tents. So they went, hmm. What they found out is that many, all of those top flowering plants, those annuals, didn't produce enough food, nectar, nourishment for the bees to sustain themselves had nothing to do with the pesticide. It had to do with that plant wasn't worth a damn in giving the bees nectar. So just because something flowers doesn't mean it produces enough nectar or pollen for nourishment in that activity. So that, of course, went on. We'll show you some other studies that we did. We also were looking at all of these studies had looked at honeybees. Well, we have over 4,000 native bee species in North America. Probably in the southeast, there are 1,500 to 2,000. We know very little about our native bees, mainly because we can't count them. We don't see them. We count honeybees every year. If you're a, a honeybee keeper, you've got hives. You have to turn in a census to the US, to USDA every year. That's why we knew they're on a deep decline is that people kept reporting losses on their managed hives. We don't know how many bumblebees are out there. Nobody's out there counting those. We don't know about all the different native bees that are still doing that ecosystem service of pollinating that we find. So this study was done in uh, Kentucky. They took four different landscape plants. Graduate student loved this. He had to go collect all the bees that he found on those four different plants. And as you can see from the four different boxes, there are very different groups of bees on each of those different plants. So that it isn't just one plant that produces, is the attractor for all the different bees that we'll see there. Again, it shows us diversity in our landscape is very important. Uh, this is a group from these early projects that we funded with HRI, typically they're a one-year project. Uh, we were able to get a multi-year, five-year funding through the Farm Bill on a, what's called an IR4 project through Rutgers University. And it's particularly one, it's called Protecting Bees. They have a website up now and beginning to show the research. But it's balancing the needs of pollinators with the need for pest management to grow and maintain beautiful plants. And the nice part about this is when we do these large um, multi-year projects is it's being run out of Rutgers, but the research stations are from Michigan, Connecticut, North Carolina, uh, Kentucky, out west, California, so it's covering the whole country and looking at the different issues that are going on. Some of the projects that we see there, um, the uptake and dissipation of neonicotinoid residues in nectar and foliage, bumblebees looking at their protein and lipid macronutrients. This one's interesting in that, uh, what's the new superfood, beets? What we call it, what, that we say, every time, every night there's a new superfood on TV. Um, we may get to a point with this is being done at Penn State that we're going to we're going to come out and say this is the superfood for bees, 
They're looking at the protein and the lipid contents of nectar and pollen because it turns out their diets are very different in those um, aspects. And so they're finding which may be the best one uh, to use in that regard. And I think there was one other that was there. Well, uh, but there's, fortunately, there's a lot more research going on. The main thing we found is that the premise that the bees in a landscape environment can get enough of a pesticide, ingest enough of a pesticide to cause them harm, has been disproven. Uh, the EPA has established that it takes 25 parts per million of the neonicotinoid insecticide to cause bee damage. The most we have found in the landscape scenario has been five parts per million, and in the lab scenario that we've done has been 11 parts per million. So well under those thresholds that are out that's been very important to EPA to say we don't see a need to ban these. Now on the other hand, EPA has said we know it's much bigger than just neonics. So right now we have 76 different chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides that are under review for their impact on bees and how they ingest it because that's what we've found in honey, in a honeybee hive, all those different chemicals. So they're looking to see what effect they may have. What it may mean is that we'll have some chemicals go away because the chemical company says, I don't make enough money off of that, I'm not going through the registration process. And that may be one of the effects that we see from it. But so far, EPA has been very good to say, let's wait for the science before we just start banning some of these things. We've had a, a wonderful conference. This was in Asheville, North Carolina. That was the first year. Uh, the second one just happened up at Michigan State. Uh, brought in people talking about pollinators. Uh, actually spoke to several from the UK. They've been dealing it with it a little longer than we have. And this is a garden in uh, the UK. That's how many of us would like our gardens to look. Uh, the important thing there uh, is the diversity of plant material. Because what we're finding, this one showed the inventory of different insects that they found within that garden. Uh, honeybees were the largest, but there were so many other bees. But what we see in all pollinator gardens, diversity of plant material, long season of bloom. And if we're not using annuals, that really showy plant like a geranium that'll bloom all summer. And we're using more perennials and woody shrubs and trees, then our gardens have to have a lot of diversity to be able to cover from early season all the way to late fall. It also makes our gardens much more interesting because they are a garden that evolves throughout the year. I think it's a perfect marriage for us because we as gardeners, that's what we want. So we're not having to change how we garden to plant for the pollinators. It's really creating a garden that we'd all love to see anyway, but it's providing that nourishment and nutrients for the insects throughout the year. Let's see what else I've got. So one of the ways that we're looking at this, especially to the general public, is what we call the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge. This came out of a large group well, it's a nationwide call to action to preserve and create gardens and landscapes that help revive the health of bees, butterflies, bird bats, and other pollinators. It'll move millions of individuals, kids, and families outdoors. I think that's a key part of it, and make a connection between pollinators and the healthy food people eat. We've always seen even this whole issue of our kids don't even know where our food comes from. So we've had an effort in trying to teach them about that, farm to table, but the pollinator aspect has to be in there as well because we don't get the farm to the table without the pollinator doing his work. So the Pollinator Garden Network was formed. Uh, it's a partnership between all these different conservation organizations, garden groups, federal agencies, um, 
and these are some of the groups. I was actually involved in two ways, both with American Hort from the green industry side, and then of course the American Public Gardens Association, which is our group of public gardens across the country. We're a perfect way of disseminating that information. And again, we talked about that. So right now we've got over 800,000 gardeners and 20,000 schoolyard gardens that have been registered as pollinator gardens. The goal is to get to a million. And to do that, you plant a pollinator garden, support pollinator friendly businesses, register your garden, and then help spread the word. Uh, they're at risk, and this is our way that we can help this problem. We want to use plants that provide nectar and pollen sources. We need to provide a water source. The nice part here, it's not like planting for, I mean, with birds, that you have to have a pool or a fountain. Water sources for most bees and butterflies could just be rocks where the irrigation water is set for a bit, uh, stones that are out, mulch, muddy areas where they muddle. It's not the same as, we, so you don't, it's not like having to build a water garden that's there. We talk about planting in the sun. The main reason for that is you get more flowers in the sun than you do in the shade. Now, I have a lot of people say, well, I, I want to plant for pollinators, but I have a very shady garden. We can do that. There are specific plants for pollinators in the shade. Your palette's a little smaller. You have to be a little more careful in what you use. But most gardens that are going to be the, the most effective will be in full sun because you'll have more flowers in full sun. Create large pollinator targets of native or non-invasive plants. You've got to be very careful there because many of the best uh, pollinator plants are invasive. Um, think of Chinese privet, that pretty, you'll see bees all over it when it's in flower. Uh, it's definitely invasive, uh, that's about. We want to establish continuous blooms throughout the growing season. And then of course eliminate, or if you have to use pesticides, make sure you do it correctly. Uh, this is the challenge, and then, as I say, register your garden. Um, this is one that has caught a lot of traction, and we think, as we hone in, I think by the end of the year, we hope to hit a million. Bef one thing before I get into specific plants that are good pollinators, we have found this out. We look at flower type. Now, this is probably one of our best pollinator plants out there. This is cone flower. Um, I wouldn't say, I usually say purple coneflower, but they're not purple anymore. They're all colors. But that's really a great example of a pollinator friendly plant that both bees and butterflies can get, um, use to land on, get to the nectar, and then fly away. So this is that classic ray type flower that both bees and butterflies use. Well, now we're planting a whole bunch of coneflowers like this. This is what the new ones. There, we love petals and big flowers. So a lot of the breeders have created double flowers. While they're great for us as a gardener and a consumer, that's not so good for a bee now. He can't get to the nectar. So while yes, I planted some of these at the botanical garden because we wanted to see how they do, we also made sure we had plenty of the other ones. Here's another example. Picture on the left is limelight hydrangea, probably one of the most popular hydrangeas that you'll see. Big, full, double flowers. The one on the right is an old-fashioned paniculata called tardiva. It's been around since the 1800s. It's kind of loose and open. Well, that one, it's hard for you to tell, but there are over a dozen butterflies down inside that flower head just getting to the nectar all over it. They can't find the nectar on limelight. Now, I wouldn't tell you, don't plant limelight, but do look at those more open and loose forms of flowers if you're looking to add them into your garden. And then the last one I'll show you is, of course, our friend the camellia. We have five different flower forms of camellias. The five different flower forms you can get. The formal double is the one we often see as the logo of a camellia. This is a double form. But many of the camellias have flowers like this. It's more of a single or semi-double. Well, this is perfect for pollinators. 
Uh, each year I do a trade show in Mobile in January. That's often where I, I do run into Jeff, is down there. And if I get a chance, I'll slip off to Bellingrath on a, on a day and to walk around the garden. And of course, you'd imagine in January, not a whole lot in bloom at, at Bellingrath Gardens, but the camellias are. And once I got involved in this, it's amazing how many bees you see where you never saw them in the past. And just walking through that garden in January, those of course were native bees out because the honeybees have all kind of gone away. But the native bees were out and covering camellias because those were one of the few plants that provide nectar at that time. So that's, um, again, think about that flower source. The resources that you have available to you, uh, the Pollinator Partnership, this is an excellent group uh, that's out, wonderful website, and they provide a plant list. What you go on the website, you type in your zip code, and then it'll come up with a PDF for your particular area. Uh, we're in, and I say we because Huntsville, Alabama and Starkville, Mississippi are pretty much in the same one, uh, that's called the Southeastern Mixed Forest Province. And you can download a PDF uh, and it'll give you a list of plants that are pollinator friendly plants. Now one thing I've found in almost all of these listings that you get uh, from these groups is that it is almost always native plant only because in the past, that's all from the B side that we knew to talk about because we were not looking at ornamentals as that function. Now we knew it was important to us because if we ever, again, if we ever wanted holly berries on a holly, we had to have a pollinator get there. So any of our plants that produce colorful fruits and berries had to be pollinated. But it is one that now we're beginning to add more of the ornamentals to that group besides just the natives. Nothing wrong with planting the natives and I encourage you to do so because that's what they're used to finding in the landscape. This is a great little group I found on Facebook. Uh, people all over the country talking about pollinator issues, posting things that are there. This is again a Facebook group. This is one, the Wildlife Habitat Council did a lot of workshops and programs on building bee houses, uh, great activities to do with kids. That's a good one to do out at the, at the trial garden. And then things like the Monarch Watch. There's a group out of Kansas uh, that does the Monarch Watch and planting milkweed gardens throughout the country. They call them Monarch Way Stations. We did a fantastic activity where uh, we actually tagged monarch butterflies at the garden, did this with uh, the best were the Girl Scout troops. We put a little sticker on the back of its wing and then released them. They're doing this all over the country and again it's tracking their progress to Mexico and then in Mexico they have a group trying to catch some to see if they can ever, it's like when you find a duck tag or other tags that are out there to see where, where it moved from. Uh, that journey of a monarch, think of a monarch from Canada to Mexico and back home again, pretty amazing. Now, the same guy doesn't do it. I think it's five generations. So if we think of a wonder of how that next generation knows where he is and where he's going when he didn't have anybody to teach him, that's pretty phenomenal uh, that happens there. So monarch watch, uh, you can even track their progress on uh, the internet. This again, the Grow Wise, Be Smart program. We really looked at it from the industry side as we needed to help our producers of plants, our managers of plants, landscape lawn care companies, landscape maintenance, as well as our greenhouse growers, and then lastly, our retail garden centers, and how they can convey this to the general public of having pollinator-friendly plants within their palette. So we've done a number of best management practices to look at those industry groups. And then lastly, I, I have to throw this one in. Um, I, we wrote the book back in 2009, uh, really looking at drought tolerance. The quickest way to solve uh, a drought is to write a book on drought tolerant landscaping because uh, this was a year after they cut the water off in Atlanta. 
you were banned from outdoor watering. It crippled the lawn and care and uh, gardens at our business in Atlanta. So we did that, much of that was looking at drought tolerance, but we were also looking at butterfly and hummingbird nectar plants, uh, song birds that attract wildlife to your garden, native plants, uh, things like this, resist deer. Now I think armadillos are worse than deer. I can live with deer, the armadillos are, are terrible. And then um, weeks of color that we could get there. But what's helpful in this particular book as well is giving you a succession calendar of knowing what flowers when and how long you can expect it to flower and whether it would be an attractor or not. Broad sweeping generalization, if it's a butterfly attracting plant, nine times out of 10, it's gonna be a bee attractor. Those two go hand in hand fairly well. Hummingbird, not so much because what we'll see with some of the pictures, hummingbirds have the ability to get nectar from flowers that bees and butterflies can't get to. They love big tubular flowers that they can hover of and get their beak down in. Well, the bee and the butterfly don't have a way to get to that. So hummingbirds will go to those plants because they know there's no competition. So it's an easy way of, if you want hummingbirds, you'll want to do that. Most all of these are going to be perennials to trees and shrubs because that gives you permanence in the garden and not something you're having to replant every single year. So some of my favorite ones uh, to use as pollinator plants, and we throw these out here because in many cases people are surprised, and the first one even surprised me. We, of course, as gardeners plant red maple because it's a fast-growing shade tree and has spectacular fall color never thought of its early bloom, which maybe for you could even be late February to 1st of March, as being one of the first plants that our native pollinators come out and get nectar from, because it's one of the very first to bloom in early spring, late winter, early spring. So it's providing that service, even though we're planting it for a different reason. Another one of my favorites, this is more, um, order of plant name than season of bloom. This is a summer flowering shrub. This is our native buckeye. Most people look at that and say that's a buckeye. Uh, it's more of a large shrub, grows in the understory of the forest, has these, it's called bottle brush buckeye because that flower looks like the old thing we wash baby bottles or test tubes with. And I just saw the, um, the one across the street from my house is just those spikes are just about to open. So we're at the beginning of its flowering season. It'll go into mid-July uh, and will be full of pollinators all over it. I also love it because of that fantastic yellow fall color. One of the things I look for in plants is something that gives me multi-season interest. A boxwood's a boxwood's a boxwood, 12 months out of the year. There's a place for that, but it pretty much looks the same all 12 months out of the year. Many of our plants give us a look, they have a winter look. The spring as it emerges, flowers comes out, the foliage in the summer, we may get fruits and berries that come, and then we have fall color. Well, that plant just gave you a whole lot of different looks in the same plant. And that's what I love to see in many of these. Here's a fantastic perennial that can take the heat and humidity of the south. It does need good drainage, uh, but it's called hummingbird mint. Agastache, uh, long bloomer, lots of different colors. There's even a very nice blue that we see in there. Does fantastic in containers or can be planted out in beds. I've got two annuals that I'm going to show you. One is Angelonia. This is what we call summer snapdragons. Uh, and it's been a good performer for us. One of the things that I dislike about many annual plantings is that you're always having to deadhead the flowers to keep them producing. Deadheading is just a way of fooling the plant that he hadn't done his job. Because to the plant, his job is produce a flower, get it pollinated, produce a seed for next year. That's his job. Well, we want the flowers, so we keep pinching the flowers off, so he says, I gotta produce another flower. Angelonia is one of those that we don't have to keep deadheading, so it's an easier plant to use in the landscape. Call it summer snapdragons because it gives us that nice, tall, spiky look. 
If I was going to ask you to plant anything in your garden, I'd say please plant milkweed. Milkweed serves two purposes. First, it's a nectar producing source for bees and butterflies. The most common one for us in the southeast is the one on the far right, the one we call butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa. But we also have the pink forms, the swamp milkweed and um, ciliated milkweed. But the orange flowers, it produces the nectar, but more importantly, it's what the monarch lays its eggs on. And so it's the host plant for the caterpillar. Butterflies are pretty ingenious in the fact that they have specific host plants that they lay their eggs on, which are different usually from their nectar sources. So the adults lay their eggs on another plant that then the eggs hatch and then the caterpillars come out and they essentially devour it. There's so many chefs I know that plant herbs in their kitchen garden, fennel, uh, dill, uh, parsley, and then they go crazy when they go outside and it's all gone. And it's, they've got swallowtail butterfly. The caterpillars are all over it, just eating it up. They're, chomp, they're just like babies, eating poop, eating poop. That's all they do. Um, so milkweed is very important to make sure that we keep the monarch succession going. A great fall blooming plant that we can use are the asters. Wonderful purple, lavender to blue flowers. Lots of different species that are native here. Uh, the ones typically Nova Angela are the typical ones that we see with these purple ray type flowers. Now butterfly bush, um, this is one interestingly that Penn State study is I think going to say that the lipid protein or whatever ratio there, it's like crack cocaine to butterflies. It's a big sugar rush that then goes away. So there's no question it attracts them, but it may not be the best plant we're seeing for butterflies now. Um, we're also wondering as we've bred these to be sterile because we don't want the seed source out there, is that impacting the nectar and content that goes on? That's one of the issues that we're having to look at as well. Caryopteris is a wonderful fall blooming perennial. I say a lot about fall blooming because it's often the forgotten season. The thing that's very important about fall bloomers is that all of these pollinators, especially the ones that hibernate, need to get nourishment at the end of the season before they go into winter. Honeybees, one of the big loss, one of the things they say is a contributing loss to overwintering is lack of nourishment as they go into the hive. We've worked them to death, especially in managed hives. They've worked them all summer long out carrying them around and then when they go into winter to overwinter, they're pooped. They just give out. So we need to make sure we have lots of nectar sources out at the fall of the year. This is also the time the monarchs are migrating. And so they need to have those sources to come through for them. There's the blues. I'm always looking for a blue flower in full sun. Many of the blues wash out in full sun. So if you can find one that can take full sun, it's very nice. And there's even a pink form. Here's another one that I was amazed with, redbud. Our native redbud blooms early in the season. Typically, it's right after red maple. And I've, I've started watching them. You go out and stand up next to a redbud, it is covered in bees. We don't really notice it because we don't get that close to them. The flowers are kind of small, but they're covered in bees. So it's a great early season plant. And then, of course, now we have so many different foliage forms for ornamentals, whether it's variegated, uh, the burgundy and now the chartreuse, the hearts of gold or rising sun. Another great mid-summer uh, bloomer, the heat of the summer, called sweet pepper bush. Whites and pinks, uh, rose colored, gets great fall color. And one reason I love this plant is it can take wet feet. And there are lots of situations in your garden where you have poor drainage. Azaleas hate wet feet. So something like sweet pepper bush is an easy plant to grow in that situation. Our good friend, the coneflower, Echinacea. Uh, this is Echinacea purpurea, but we also have 
many different other colors. Um, there are some, I love the powwow berry, bright color that's come out now. We have white. Um, Kim's knee high is an excellent choice. Here's a native called Eupatorium or Jopi weed. Jopi weed, what a great name. Uh, the flowers on this will be almost as big as a basketball. And these start blooming in August when it's just miserable outside. They start to the flower. They'll go August into September. And again, you'll start to see monarchs all over those getting nectar as they're coming through. Gallardia is another native um, southeastern wildflower. Bright colors, oranges, yellows, reds, bicolors that are there. This is sunset flash. And then our hollies. Again, hollies are male and female plants, separate plants. Most plants have male and female flowers either on the same flower or different flowers on the same plant. This one is I got a male plant and I got a female plant. The females are the only ones that are going to have berries, but you got to have some males somewhere to get the pollen over to the female. Almost all the beekeepers I know, especially if they're planning for a windbreak, will do a row of holly because it gives them the nice evergreen windbreak, but also early season nectar source. Doesn't really matter, matter which one. This is American holly. It could be Dahoon holly. It could be, I love, Vomitoria. Got to love who named that. Uh, and why do you think he named it that way? Um, but, you know, the Yopon holly. So any of the hollies work very well. Uh, for this. Lantana, I used to often say if I only had one plant, if they told me I could only plant one thing at the garden for butterflies, and that was it, it'd probably be Lantana. It blooms the longest, drought tolerant, pest free, and um, gave us the most bang for our buck. If you love hummingbirds, plant the native honeysuckle. Here's a great example of a wonderful, you see the flower, the long tubular flower. These become, these start to flower when the scouts are migrating up from south to north. So this is Lanicera sempervirens. It's the good honeysuckle. It's our native. I had to throw Alabama crimson in just because of the audience, but um, it is a good plant for hummingbirds. Now here's one that I quit growing entirely early in my career. Um, in the South, bee balm gets eaten up with powdery mildew. It just happens. You, it's like the zinnias, the old zinnias. You plant them, it looks good for about a month, and then once you hit into June, the you know thunderstorms, I mean, they're eaten up with powdery mildew. Well, I don't want to spray. I don't want to plant like that in the garden, so I just quit planting them. Well, the good news, just like zinnias, the breeders bred disease-resistant forms. And this is a new one from Proven Winners called the Pardon My Series, Pardon My Cerise. And we're back to a plant we can use that we won't have to worry about spraying. Bright red colors, uh, all summer long bloomer, and there's a lavender form as well. Who's had Tupelo honey? That comes from the black gum or tupelo tree. Now we plant it for the red fall color, one of the best fall colors you'll find anywhere. But the bees love it for those flowers that'll happen about 1st of May. The leaves have already come out, then the flowers come, and then you'll see the blue-black fruit that is later. So another tree that's there. And then here's my other annual that I use a lot, the pintas. Uh, in this picture, you can see a bumblebee on it. We always have butterflies all over this nice pincushion type flower. Every garden I do has got, if I've got coneflower, I've got black-eyed Susans. They almost have to go out of the garden center hand in hand. Uh, and there are lots of different forms of black-eyed Susan that we can do. Uh, Goldstrom is one of the best old favorites, but Little Henry is quite good. Irish Eyes is one with a green eye, but excellent long season producers. I show this picture, this is a salvia. Uh, I show it because it's a blue flower and there's a hummingbird. Now a lot of people still say, well I thought I had to plant red flowers for hummingbirds. They do go to red, 
Uh, there's no question about that. Somebody told me once that they go to red because bees don't see red. I don't know who did the bee te eye test for the bees to say they couldn't see it, but it's really the flower form the bee is not going to go to. But this is salvia black and blue, a very nice salvia. This one is a fall blooming salvia, uh, the Mexican sage or salvia leucantha. Bees are all over this one. And then this is a great little one. I think you talked about this one before, Microphylla, the hot lips. And it's got the little landing pad where the bee can get to where the nectar is. And then I do like the black and blue, or this, the newest one is black and bloom that's out. Again, for the fall, autumn, the sedum is spectacular. Uh, nice succulent foliage throughout the year, and then it flowers up August, September, into October. And then goldenrod, plant that gets a bad rap. Uh, we're not allergic to goldenrod. We're allergic to ragweed. So this one you can plant and not sneeze. I'm very allergic to ragweed, so I can say that with, as, from authority. But fall bloomer, lots of flowers, easy to grow. For us in the garden, you want to plant a dwarf form like fireworks. It's better for us as in a garden setting. What you're going to see out in the meadows and pathways is just the straight species that's out, and they get much taller and leggier. Um, and I think I've got one more. The last one I'll do is, of course, blueberries. We don't get blueberries unless we get a pollinator. So it is a great pollinator plant, a great ornamental for us to use in our gardens. And again, to me, a great three season interest plant with the flowers, the foliage, and then fruits and fall color. So those are many of the plants you can do in your garden. The best thing you can do is have lots of diversity and long season of bloom. I encourage you to plant some milkweed and then if you're so inclined, register your garden or your church, your school, a community area as a pollinator garden with the Million Pollinator Garden website. I'd love to answer any questions anybody has and I truly appreciate the opportunity of coming over and talking to you tonight. Any questions? Surely somebody's got them. Yeah. It's scaring the hell out of me that he's <laughs> recording over there. So, so as, <laughs> as far as the recording goes, um, all of these are being posted on um, online. If you go to the, the <coughs> Trial Gardens website, um, there will, we have links to all of the, the past ones, and this one will be there as well. Um, and there's also a link on the, the main extension website. Um, but that website name is so long that I can't remember what it is. Um, so I'm going to send you to my website. So, so yeah, Mississippi State Trial. Yeah, if you Google that, it, it's yeah, it will it'll be there. Yes, ma'am. Typically, it always goes back to what's the issue you have. With tomatoes, it's often tomato hornworms. Yeah. Pick them off. Best, best, best way to do that is pick them off. Because they're, one, they're typically not so prolific. You can see them, those little son of a guns will scare you to death, but you can grab them and go. In many cases, often it's aphids is another one. Soapy water. Soapy water is a good one we can use. Um, to go out from there. So it's usually specific. Uh, neem oil is an organic insecticide, fungicide. We've got to be careful with neem oil just on temperature. Anything that's an oil base, we worry about as the days get hotter, then all of a sudden there's a chance of burning. But early season, it's quite good. Um, Squash, you know, typically the, my worst with squash is, is squash vine borer, and what I've tried to do, I'd do two things. I would cover it with the spun-bound fabric, Remay, when the insect's flying. 
about two or three weeks where it's kind of knowing the life cycle of insects is often very good in control. So I'd cover the plant so it still got light and water through it, but the little fly couldn't get down. And then I was very vigilant in looking at any time I saw a little hole and I would slice it and get it out. Second thing I'd do is I'd plant a second crop because he's gone. He's already laid his eggs and he's over with, so I'd plant the second crop and try to, try to make it that way. Have you ever used a product called replacement mulch? It's like sheets. Uh, yeah. I've, I've heard about it, especially they're using more with light reflectivity and increased fruiting. Uh, I know Dr. Bachman was doing that, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah, I was thinking that was where I saw his. The red mulch, especially for tomatoes. The shiny mulches, they were showing that in Florida with tomatoes. Yeah. Um, when they're really little, it helps. It disorients white flies and things like that. But once they get to be that tall, you, you lose. It, it's not disorienting to them. Right. And it, it, got, you know, it only weirds them out if they get closer <laughs> to them. <laughs> And yeah, well, and again, trying to hit early in, any time with an insect or disease, the quicker you can get in on it before it has a chance to reproduce. Sure, sure. Yeah. But all the labels now, please read them because they're going to give you a bee advisory warning. Typically, um, and the one that's scaring, really we're worried about the most right now, I mean, how many of us grew up with a mosquito truck coming through the neighborhood as kids? We'd run behind it, that was really smart. Um, <laughs> felt good, I mean, that, yeah. <laughs> um, they always sprayed at night. Now, mosquitoes were out at night, but the other reason is bees aren't. They've gone back. Well, first time we saw Zika virus, and all of a sudden I see on TV Miami, they're going through the neighborhoods with these backpack blowers spraying, it's middle of the day. And it's because that typical, a particular mosquito foraged during the day. Well, the first thought is, oh my goodness, we got a public health crisis, understand that, but you're also spraying a product that probably is affecting so many other things that are out. Um, haven't heard anything out of the Florida area. We do know in South Carolina, quarter of a million bees were killed by an aerial application of the product used for Zika. And so we'll probably be having lots of debates here on how do we weigh those two, especially if they're spraying during the day. I've seen a proliferation of companies jumping up, mosquito spray, you know, the zappers are much better from a bee and butterfly standpoint, but again, when you're worried about uh, health hazards, how do we balance those two? Another thing that he did, kind of comes back to one of the points he was making was um, diversity in your garden. Um, that's one of the things that we do a lot of at the gardens here is we, we have a lot of other, we leave some weedy areas, we leave some, and that helps us maintain our predator population. Um, and that's, that's actually done, uh, there's, we have this kind of, we call it our bioswale, but it's really just a weedy drainage ditch. Um, don't call um, yours a weedy drainage ditch. Yeah, don't call it, <laughs> I mean, your neighbors don't like it if you call it a weedy one. drainage ditch. But it, um, since we've let that grow up, um, our pest populations have dramatically declined. Um, so just having, you know, a place where you can have some of these predators yeah. I, I grew up at a time, and you hate to say this today, but the best management practice for nursery production, this was late 70s, early 80s, we, we sprayed every two weeks, killed everything there was. And you sprayed the whole nursery, and you had completely clean nursery, but you killed everything. And then we realized over time that was not the best practice to go, and so now we have no one does that anymore, but that's what we thought was our best way to go. We killed all the predators. So then when you got an outbreak of one, nothing stopped him, and especially if you missed it. So 
Um, having these predator populations and uh, diversity is very important. Yes, ma'am. Could, um, my, my first answer is I would say no, because our testing has shown that they can't get enough of the midlocropid through the nectar. Now, that's crepe myrtle bark scale, I'll say in Huntsville, I saw my first tree the other day, and I didn't want to go look at it. Somebody said, I think we've got it. And I went and looked, and damn, we've got it. And we have found the only thing so far that has worked at all is neonicotinoid systemic insecticides. So we know we're going to have to use them in those um, situations to control it. But because of all the spraying, especially in the Memphis area and others, to control this, it could have an adverse effect. And won't, won't say that something else did. The good part about a systemic is that you don't have drift, the unintended consequence of you outside spraying and then drifts to another area. That's the other reason that's so good. Uh, the other one with Neonix is it's probably the safest for mammals. Most of us don't realize, but the flea and tick collar you put on your cat and dog is a neonicotinoid insecticide. Uh, you wouldn't put anything on your child which is usually our cat or dog, that you thought would harm them. And so it is very safe for us. Um, as, in, as a worker and worried about my employees spraying and applying pesticides, I definitely like them because it's one of the safest for us to use. Um, I still remember the days here of applying Timic. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not a bright thing either. But, uh, well, I hope some of this was beneficial to you. Oh, one. I have one more question. Sure. No. Can you tell me about the safety of diatomaceous earth? You know, I, somebody else asked me the other day about it. It's, it's very safe for us because it's actually crystalline and it um, irritates and breaks the skin of the grubs growing in the ground or other uh, critters that are there. It's not really a poison at all. It's a, type, it's a mineral that's mined doesn't injure the bees necessarily because again they're they're just only way they would get is if they took it through what, probably gutation water on the plant but we haven't seen anything with that so far earthworms it won't bother because of the way something about the way their bodies are that because i was very worried about that with soil applications because you do want the best thing you can do if you dig in your soil and see earthworms you go hallelujah I mean, because that's, that's telling, you, telling you good stuff. The books are actually, they're normally 35. I'll do them for 30 tonight, just with this wonderful crowd that's here. And you yet to be a fan of white ever. <laughs> it's the mustache. She hasn't so. aged yeah. <laughs> um, So if you're interested, love, you can get it on Amazon as well, but I'd love to sign them. Or do, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much.